Hello and welcome to the latest SPAG dialogue on the new and evolved role of leadership in employee engagement. We are honored to have a great place to work as one of our knowledge partners. And wow, what an eclectic mix of speakers we have with us today. Well, apart from the speakers, we also have a very interesting and curious audience. Before we begin, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. The year 2020 has been an unprecedented one for us. Organizations categorically have gone through a lot of overhaul. The employees were going through a lot of work and life pressures. Um, there was dropping productivity, lesser connectivity. The leaders, however, were, on a, were treading a path of evolution. A few of these leaders and organizations actually took an initiative and utilized this crisis as an opportunity to transform. Transform to better engage with their employees, transform to change their employee strategies and to empower. And I'm so happy to have few of those leaders and speakers with us today. That's all. I would like to begin with you. I would like to know what was your journey with Rakuten organization in the last year? I'm sure the organization faced challenges. What were those prominent challenges and how did you and the leadership at Rakuten manage to address it? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Begumita. And also I appreciate uh, to be given this opportunity to make a conversation with great panelists, thank you. So in Rakuten, uh, we are a tech company and we have the several offices uh, in uh, not only Asia, but also uh, global wide. And as same as other companies, the most challenging thing in this pandemic situation is lack of touch points with corporate culture, uh, especially in onboarding process. So as a countermeasure, our CEO, uh, Miki, tried to have that, uh, I'll say, a book reading session. Uh, for especially uh, new joiners uh, every morning for 30 minutes and using his uh, book and uh, read one chapter together and uh, making the Q&A session with the new joiners to share our core value and company's philosophy. And second one is, uh, as you can imagine, we lost a touch point with the physical office environment. So our uh, general affairs department team provided uh, virtual reality uh, contents to visit our headquarters office for especially for new joiners. So these two uh, countermeasures a little bit, uh, I'll say, good work. But anyhow, uh, again, our most uh, challenging thing is the lack of touch point with corporate culture. So this is our situation. That's a very interesting point that you made. Of course, uh, onboarding has an issue and a challenge with uh, most of the organizations, you know, in uh, remote work setups. Um, but, uh, you know, the point that you made about virtual reality using uh, uh, technology um, uh, to, to enable was, was a very interesting one. Here in, you know, I, I want to bring in Norbert. And Norbert, I know that BD has been doing a lot of initiatives around employee engagement. There has been a very high focus on people and culture, setting the right culture in the organization. How did your employee engagement strategies evolve because of the pandemic? Were there any uh, change in strategies that you did, something new uh, that you uh, took up uh, to address these challenges? So good question. Uh, I, I would say in a very interesting way, I would say it made life almost easier. And I tell you why, it's not what you people would expect because it made it much more important for everybody. Every company before was working on employee engagement and it was kind of like the usual thing to do. And suddenly the topic went off the charts and you know, like became super important for every CEO around the world. How do we engage our employees? It was always there, but now the spotlight was put on and on employee well-being and employee safety and, and all that. So obviously finding new ways was the challenge, but the importance and the desire in senior management team to do something about it and to deal with it has increased exponentially, which, which really created new opportunities for us as well. So, so, so that, that would be the, the, the perspective. So we have started 
that's what I mean. Many years ago, always doing different uh, programs. But I think the new element, of course, here is obviously the physical non-presence and how we're gonna incorporate that. And the, the other big element was we've been always talking about employee well-being, but we've been thinking a little bit about work and employee well-being. And I think the new insight was that these two things need to now come together and how can we incorporate the well-being of our employees into the way we design work or expect work for them. So, so many of our thinking around uh, uh, the last couple of months, and it's still ongoing because it's not finished, uh, has, been, has been around that thinking is in this new normal, whatever it is, I don't think it's finished yet, how can we incorporate the well-being of our employees into the, the way we design and think about work? That's a wonderful point that you made, uh, Norbert, that, you know, um, it, it just changed and the focus came towards employee well-being. It was always there, but there was an additional focus. Um, at this juncture, Neha, I, I know uh, that, uh, you know, IBM is an organization which, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly digitally evolved, the employees as well as the organization as a whole. Um, while the other organizations uh, would have gone through a uh, big transition in terms of, you know, remote work setups, et cetera, that might not have been the case for IBM. Um, were there still challenges? And what were the challenges that an organization like IBM would have faced during this time? Hi, Vagmita. Hi to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Neha Pari, the Singapore and ASEAN HR leader for IBM. Uh, I think, I think it's a good question. I, one of the things um, that the pandemic taught us um, was the critical importance of technology, right? Uh, which enables speed, flexibility, insight, innovation, all of which was required during the pandemic. Um, so yes, technology was critical. I think what changed was the pace at which we moved um, throughout the world, right? And during the pandemic, uh, IBM continued to sustain the digital operations of the world's most critical organizations, be it the banks, the telcos, the retailers, the healthcare providers, government agencies. And what this taught us was that our employees, a segment that was supporting um, these critical operations were essential, a term that by the way, we have to thank the pandemic for. So that was new. And how do you make sure that they are safe, uh, they are taken care of, because if, and literally I remember seeing a picture of one of our employees in one of the Singapore hospitals standing next to the doctor and you, would, you could not tell who was the IBMer and who was the doctor because they were both in those suits. Um, so this kind of taught us that it's important to recognize and really take care of our essential workforce. So that was one. The second was uh, similar to what Norbert said. There was all, always a focus on wellness, but just wellness and productivity came to the forefront. Um, I remember we were able to take our workforce remote very, very quickly, but it's very important to not just where work is being done, but how work is being done. So because employees can see each other, how do you ensure that they're still productive? So we came up with this uh, virtual collaborator batch, which meant that if you're working remotely, you know, how do you increase the productivity? So teaching people to whiteboard uh, virtually on mural or um, being able to do these calls. Um, I think what also changed was our culture significantly. Um, I remember a quarter into the pandemic after it was announced, um, our CEO posted a pledge, which was called the work from home pledge, um, which meant really telling people the rules of the road. Because sometimes, you know, you're not camera ready all the time. So I pledge not to, it's okay for my team or myself not to be camera ready. I pledge to be kind because the, you know, I have two little girls who would be screaming at times when I was working from office. I pledge to just, you know, be able to work collaboratively. So the list goes on, but those little changes and understanding and empathizing with the fact that people were actually, we've taken the office to our homes and giving people a sneak peek of that and no one had to be sorry for those disruptions. I think that was a beautiful change and just everyone coming together. And slowly as we are coming into office, realizing that if you can do something from home, 
doing it from office is not the point. The point is, how do you use office differently? So we also did a jam, which was an employee jam of 350,000 employees who came together to really define what the future of the workplace would look like. And 2021 will be the year where we will be implementing major changes in the way we work and how we work, where we work, all of that. So more to unfold from IBM on that. That's, that's wonderful. And um, um, uh, all of you, I mean, we, we are at a jun juncture in a conversation where we have, you know, such interesting points, uh, uh, those challenges, as well as how uh, leaders, leaders, as well as organizations actually uh, underwent changes to accommodate those scenarios. Uh, so um, we, uh, we have uh, uh, insights from Tatsuo, we have it from Norbert and from Neha. Um, at this juncture, um, you know, I would want to introduce an external perspective. And, and we have uh, um, Evelyn and uh, Ram with us here. Um, I would like to understand, and you know, our audience would also want to know that uh, by way of your uh, working with a lot of other member and partner organizations, uh, during the pandemic, I am certain you would have seen few knights in the shining armor, few organizations and leaders who stood out uh, in their strategies, in the things that they did right, which, you know, helped the organization to support their employees better, engage better. Uh, so um, maybe Evelyn, you can start first and, you know, um, would like to know were there any strategies or anything which stayed with you and which you felt that this was exemplary? All right, thank you. Um, well, I represent Great Place to work in Singapore and Asia. And every year, Great Place, what we do is we curate a list of best workplaces. Um, and last year, like other years, we had our annual list. But what we did was to adapt our process, uh, recognizing that this was an unusual year. Uh, we adapted our curation process to recognize companies who have responded to the crisis in what we call in a heroic way. So just last month, we released the report of what we saw as great, work, uh, great practices across our best workplaces in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I want to just share three um, of the seven key characteristics that we saw. Um, and we saw that in the best workplaces, what was very common was that leaders were very uh, deliberate to put their people first. Um, in the times where people are working across locations and we don't see our people working from nine to six, um, there was a great trust that the people were trusted to do what was best for themselves and what was best for the organization. The other bit that we saw was that um, in this progressive companies, the leaders, they were very adept in creating psychological safety. What we mean was that they were able uh, to demonstrate and to encourage empathy and for themselves to even show vulnerability that this was really a difficult situation, not just for you, but also for me. And to openly share their struggles, share their challenges, both personal and professional, and to be able to ask for what they need. Um, in some cases, mm -hmm. we saw leaders themselves in a role modeling by taking time off, uh, making sure that there were days wow. where there were no meetings, just so that companies and employees can have some downtime. Another key, yeah, another key principle we saw was really just a very specific focus uh, to enable and to support their people managers. Um, the reality is that many people are very used to managing by FaceTime, uh, to see the people in the office and to manage by when the people come in, when they leave the office, when they come back from lunchtime. So for managers to be able to uh, to lead a remote team effectively, many people leaders are not used to that kind of arrangement. So what we found mm. is that some companies, they were very deliberate to, uh, to train and to equip and to support their leaders in managing remote teams. They've got webinars, they've got talks. Uh, they even have dedicated conversations and coaches just to help uh, leaders transit from a, uh, from a management style in which they remote by FaceTime to a style where they remote by outcomes. So I think this was some of the characteristics that we saw across best workplaces that uh, were really uh, exemplary for all, for all of us to follow. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. And I, I do see a lot of synergies in what Evelyn just mentioned and what uh, Neha was talking about, you know, uh, the fact that the, the CEO pledge that Neha spoke about, wherein, you know, there was an effort made to ensure that people feel comfortable. And um, uh, the, the, that, that's the way to show empathy. Uh, Ram, what about you? I mean, we would love to hear um, your thoughts and your uh, uh, on this topic as well. Sure, thanks very much and uh, very happy to be here. Um, the great, the great uh, thing about talking last is that you get to hear about what others have said. <laughs> and I can probably repeat a lot of what they've said, but uh, great points by every one of them. I'm probably going to just say, you know, very spot on. Um, 
in, in, in what we have seen across. Um, interestingly, um, you know, we've had the opportunity to work across a number of organizations and, and, and therefore get a bit of a sense of what the responses have been. First thing to acknowledge is the fact that, you know, leaders themselves are, we're going through this together with everyone else. So you are a human being and a leader and therefore, you know, um, in an unprecedented um, event like this in our lives, um, as, as everybody kind of acknowledges now, it's, it's a once in a lifetime kind of an event. Um, we are learning and we are learning. And so some of the things that we have seen work very well are those that have been very quick to kind of recognize the opportunity and, 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 and see how they bring about those changes uh, where, 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 where in, you know, the ones that adapted fairly quickly. Um, so if I were to kind of you know, summarize into about three or four characteristics of what I've seen, the leadership that, that organizations have demonstrated or individuals or leaders have demonstrated, uh, it's the first, you know, and these are some of the qualities, and these leadership qualities have always remained the same pre or post COVID. But I think some of these, you know, leadership qualities kind of come up, come up at the top uh, when you start to observe what 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 how how leaders have responded. The first, obviously, is you know uh, the adaptability um, with with what I call as alacrity, right? Um, because we needed to respond. If you kind of go back in March timeframes, February, March timeframe, uh, we had very little time to kind of move from everything physical to everything digital in most countries. And that required, you know, organizations to rapidly, in a very short period of time, um, move everything um, that they have been used to for the longest of the time to be done remotely, it required significant amount of effort and, 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 you know, action from everyone in the organization to be able to do that. Uh, I've, you know, I was talking to the to the CEO of OCBC Malaysia. He said uh, uh, they had 18 hours to uh, uh, move the entire headquarters um, and empty the entire headquarters. So imagine, you know, one of the big banks headquarters being asked to, because they were in that zone where they had to completely vacate the building. And they had 18 hours to galvanize everything together and move everyone out and start operations um, remotely. That's just as an example of you know, uh, the kind of leadership that is required to make this happen. And, and, and that's one thing that, I, you know, we, start, we saw that happen. Um, the other thing, and, and we touched upon the topic of empathy and all of that, I think there's a big recognition of the fact that we're going to move away from, uh, or what rather we moved away from what I call as episodic empathy to a prolonged and a, and a continuous empathy. And what do I mean by that, right? We've always been empathy, you know, had demonstrated empathy when, you know, the staff have had certain situations, right? And that's what I mean by an episode. If there was an episode in one of our employees or we would, you know, look after them. I think that's changed now. Now it's no more about episodes. It's about the fact that you need to be consistent and constantly thinking about their, you know, um, work environment, which is now going to be either the workplace or so-called office or, or wherever they want to choose to work from and be empathetic to that, right? At the points that they have made about, you know, children going around or, you know, cats going around in some cases, whatever, right? But that empathy is now going to be much more continuous. I think leaders are beginning to understand that. I don't think it's natural for human beings to be, empath you know, have empathy all the time. So this is something will continue to evolve uh, uh, from a leadership perspective. Um, the third thing what I would say is in learning to lead in absence. Um, it's not easy. Um, many organizations, especially if you context it in Singapore's perspective, we as a nation have not been very, very uh, um, uh, compared to, let's say, some of the other countries like, you know, the United States or the UK, not used to having people working remotely. <laughs> and, and that's a very important thing to recognize that is very specific to this nation. And, and what it actually meant is that a lot of us became uncomfortable with the whole concept of my team's not going to work it with me or I'm not going to see them every day. And that then brought about a whole question of how do I then lead and how do I ensure that I still get the right output and the right outcomes we want to achieve out of that. So that's, that's something that I think people are continuing to understand what it means and how do you do that. Um, the, the, the other important aspect, and again, if I were to summarize based on what I've heard from the others as well, communication. Communicate, 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 right? Um, 
the more you start to you know um, you know share, whether it's through personal stories or whether you know reinforcing your values or whatever, um, there is a greater focus around communication, both internally and externally, um, to drive uh, these type of changes. So. Those are some of the things that have come about um, in what I would say as evolving leadership qualities and, 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 and examples that we're starting to see across. This is, this is very insightful, Ram and uh, Evelyn. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, uh, at, at this point in time in the conversation, um, I believe that everything that we're discussing, you know, has, has had uh, these few words coming up again and again, the employee well-being adaptability, things happen so suddenly and true leadership uh, you know, was required to take a, a stance of that. And at the same time, there's this one common thread that all of us are referring to, which is technology. Technology really was, uh, you know, it was indeed that pillar which kept the businesses going. If it was not at this level, uh, and if the organizations had not transformed the way they did overnight, um, businesses would have not been afloat. And uh, realizing that fact, you know, I, I would want to know, and um, here I, I would probably have Neha and uh, uh, Taxwo, if you can share your views that, you know, when everything around us is becoming so virtual and technology led, uh, what is it that organizations can do? And maybe if your organization did that to bring in, uh, keep bringing in time and again, the element of empathy, understanding, and uh, you know the human touch to things. Uh, maybe we can start with Neha. Sure. So um, I, I I I would agree with that, right? We sometimes it's very easy. Someone was telling me over lunch today. Uh, it's easy to dehumanize people in the virtual world. So if you know people switch off their video, you just see their initials. It's very easy to dehumanize versus when you are seeing them face to face. So we've got to recognize those things and not um, think that, oh, you know, in the virtual world is just as fine. Uh, I think recognition of the fact that it's different enables us to tackle the situation and actually be more empathetic. Um, I, I think a few things that we discovered through our employee surveys. Um, so we did an employee pulse, really a quick question to ask employees, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Are you able to be productive? Do you think you have enough support? What else would you need? You know, basic questions just to ask them. And mm -hmm. depending on, it was very interesting, depending on how the pandemic was going, the responses would go up and down. Uh, like I can tell you out of the six countries that I was uh, personally responsible for in ASEAN, I could see like right now, there's so much stress that my team in Indonesia is facing with uh, the rise of the cases. Uh, Malaysia, likewise. Singapore, a little less so, you know, and sometimes it goes up and down. So it's very interesting to um, note the correlation. Having said that, um, all employees really look to organizations. And this is broadly, right? Because there was so much information coming in from so many places when we did not understand what this pandemic was, that they actually appreciated the sole source of information from the organization, which was authentic even though, and I think a lot of us admitted, we are learning as we go along. This is what we know now. No one tried to say, oh, this is, you know, no one tried to completely. Uh, so, so I think that whole vulnerability of saying, we don't know everything, this is what we know. That's very important during any of these phases and especially when, you know, so much transformation and change is happening. Um, we announced our CEO and a new CHRO during the pandemic. So usually it's a very big event because it happens once in a decade for IBM. Mm -hmm. And this was done virtually. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that there are these touch points? So our CEO and the CHRO, both of them, the CEO did these sessions, which were updates, you know, really CEO office hours. You could ask him anything. And people said things like, Arvind, you know, we saw these great videos and you are you just so casual. Why? And he said, I much rather come to you and tell you the authentic truth than prepare and, you know, wait for the perfect moment. So I'm I prefer more frequency to once, you know, just a prepped up event. I think just authentic leadership and just being in touch. There were many times where he said, we'll figure it out and we'll come back. Um, I think the other thing that um, we started focusing on was just accepting the fact that as much as the attention that we paid to being physically fit, you know, we applaud 
when people are like, oh, I'm doing this or, you know, I'm taking care of my health, nutrition. Likewise, we need to applaud people who are taking care of their mental well-being. And that's what we started with sessions on um, mindfulness, sessions on counseling, uh, coaching, uh, not to say that only a few people need it, almost to say it's like a gym. Um, productivity, I spoke about in terms of tools and just enabling employees. Fun. Employees said, I don't know how to have fun. So we did these virtual retreats uh, where people would just come together and there were events and fun activities. It just created so much engagement and just genuine empathy. Some of the performances, including mine singing, were genuinely bad, but they just made people laugh and be happy. Um, and then skills. I think we have to understand that while this pandemic was going on, really people, you know, how do you upskill people? So we hosted something called Learn Olympics. Um, and this was in ASEAN, a fun competition between the six countries. Um, now, obviously the real Olympics had, uh, you know, couldn't happen. So we did this little marathon and it just engaged people, brought them together virtually. And then we did a virtual ceremony. So I think anything creative, and all of these ideas came up top, middle, bottom, everywhere. Um, so I guess, you know, just including everyone and figuring it along together and just being vulnerable worked for us in IBM. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's quite a few interesting initiatives that you took up, Neha, for IBM. And uh, um, I, I actually am I'm kind of stuck on one this point. And I do know that, you know, um, uh, Evelyn is also an expert in this field. And um, maybe I, will, um, I would like to pose this question to you as well as Evelyn Neha. I'm curious to know, there are a lot of organizations which have started uh, thinking uh, about you know, doing these kinds of surveys to understand what's the mental state well-being of employees. Uh, they are actually putting in place behavioral experts. There are a few organizations which are taking the approach of neuroscience. Um, what is your view and maybe, you know, uh, uh, Neha, uh, first you and then Evelyn, you can talk about it that, you know, um, do you think this, uh, this is going to change the way we are looking at our workforce in the future? You mean the surveys and the way we are just new? I'm trying to understand the, the uh, you know, the mindset of the uh, people. What are they thinking? Uh, how are they behaving oh. in these situations? How will this evolve? Yeah, I think I think we the approach of first of all we do recognize that there's something called survey fatigue, right? So it's important not to overload anyone with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. The second um, um, is, you know, before you design a solution, like every time instead of saying, "Oh, this is what I'm going to do in HR for engagement or skills," you know, just reaching out and crowdsourcing. That is what is working for us in this phase, you know, just crowdsourcing ideas and saying, what is it that you need? And that's when we were told, I'm really not feeling good. I don't have, you know, and that's when we realized that you mental well-being matters. We also realized, and this is a study that was done that, uh, uh, you know, uh, complaints of bullying increased during the pandemic, because when managers could not see, you know, some, the style changed, and then you start chasing or calling up and employees were very stressed already. So all of those episodes happen. So I, I think to your answer, is this the way we are going to go? Um, absolutely. I think it's a good way instead of prescribing, really subscribing to everyone's views and solutioning the problem that people are pointing out versus assuming the problem um, has really, really worked for us. And I, I personally, I think this is the best way HR could contribute, you know, really knowing from the, learning from the employees and then solving and then saying, this is what I can do and this is what I'm really working on. So continuous feedback on what we are doing with their input is very, very important to work with Yeah. Thank you so much, Neha. Evelyn, uh, what do you think, uh, you know, how much focus organizations will be putting in on uh, studying the behavior and uh, the emotional yeah. aspects of employees? Um, I think if I look at companies in Singapore and Asia, the reality is it's a, there's a spectrum, right? Um, you have got the more progressive organizations who are all for listening more. I mean, as a principal, no one's going to say that listening is not a good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. And the progressive ones are those with the resources, with the platforms, with the uh, with the with the systems in place to be able to uh, to survey regularly, um, in a spectrum we have got those companies, and I've, I've spoken with companies where they are still saying that this is a bad time to survey. I don't want to survey, um, and many times that is being fueled by a fear of 
I don't know what's wrong and therefore I can I need not do anything about that right but once I know what's wrong if I don't do anything about it then I'll look back in front of my employees and there's a spectrum of companies like that um, um, as a great place to work we are saying that listening is definitely important regular surveys is definitely the trend to go um, but what's more important beyond uh, survey fatigue that we're all familiar with is that HR gets fatigued um, and what's important is how do HR respond to the, to, the, to the, how do we react or what do we do with the data that we collect? Um, because um, it's more detrimental to collect data and mm -hmm. not do anything about them uh, because right. over time it's going to cause uh, a, a, a sense of why do I bother telling you what I'm thinking when I don't see any changes in at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're not saying that we do not listen or do not, we do not conduct pauses. We should do that, uh, but it needs to be done in a sustainable way. Um, and HR needs to think, or leaders need to think that changes doesn't need to come in a huge exponential way. Uh, it can happen in small steps, right? Small, small wins. Um, and that, um, and not to only do we make changes to improve, what's important is to communicate outwards to the staff um, that this is the feedback, this is what we have done, and these are the changes. Because many times we do a good job changing policies, you know, adapting the practices, but we don't do as good a job in communicating outwards what we have done and what impact mm -hmm. it does to staff. Uh, so the corresponding follow-up follow -up actions for HR to take, to communicate, to update, to, uh, to equip the leaders um, is really important. Um, at the end of the day, our people don't leave the organization. They leave because their immediate leaders um, are not great leaders, are not great people managers. Um, it's equally important to ensure that our people leaders are aligned with the organizational values, uh, with the philosophy, with the culture, so that what is being experienced by the people on a day-to-day basis and what's being preached forth uh, by the HR team, by the senior leadership team are all aligned. Otherwise, there'll be a disconnect as well. That's, that's very useful information, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Um, I, I also know, as a matter of fact, that Rakuten has been doing um, some very interesting uh, activities, you know, around uh, making employees feel valued and happy. Uh, uh, that's all. Would you want to uh, talk about how you tried to fill in that um, understanding, empathy, and care gap, which was introduced because of remote setups in your organization? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, as same as the all of the uh, other companies, uh, we need to uh, for emphasize the importance of the communication. So, in order to show the leadership empathy to the uh, employees, uh, we secured uh, how to say, a casual uh, Q&A session uh, between leadership and the employees uh, more uh, frequently. So originally, uh, this is the unique way, but we have a weekly all hands meeting with uh, 20,000 employees globally. So this is the kind of ritual uh, meeting style in Rakuten, but it helps us to have the casual uh, interaction with uh, leadership team and through that uh, communication, for example, uh, if that uh, leadership can uh, make some comment more uh, how say localized uh, message to the employees. So this is that uh, helpful and feel more uh, human touch uh, from the leadership message. And uh, at the same time, uh, if the people can uh, how say share some challenge or issues from the members perspective to leadership team directly. So this is the good situation to have the good relationship between leadership and the members. So this is the good thing. At the same time, uh, from my team, my team is that a kind of institution to research about uh, people and culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, we collect information uh, from worldwide about big tips uh, to promote well-being in that organization. So we collaborate with Gallup uh, in the United States and uh, Harvard Business School and other uh, external professionals uh, to create collective well-being guideline, uh, including uh, how to make team well connected, how to uh, how to design their time uh, well spent, and uh, how to organize their place uh, well prepared. So those kind of things are uh, included under the guidelines. And also the most importantly, 
uh, we, we emphasize that uh, three key elements, as I mentioned, plus uh, breathing space in that uh, time schedule or uh, physical place, working place in the home or everything. So this breathing space uh, could contribute the creativity or well-being or everything for sustainable growth in the team and individuals. So these guidelines uh, help the people to feel that, uh, I'll say, empathy uh, from the company. So they, the, the company respects the individual uh, well-being. So this is the one of that uh, approach we had. At the same time, I believe that, that uh, following that other panelist comments, especially in the survey matter, uh, the main category or criteria uh, focusing on not only engagement topics, but also well-being or communication uh, mm -hmm. matter. So maybe this is the coming uh, trend in the survey uh, area, I believe. Very true. Very true. So, um, you know, deriving cues from what all of you have just mentioned that, you know, now the organizations are kind of investing more time to understand how scenarios have changed. These are very micro changes that we're talking about. Uh, what Neha and Evelyn mentioned that, you know, uh, how um, a manager is treating an associate, how uh, unknowingly the culture of bullying is increasing during a pandemic. Um, how breathing space, you know, you're not realizing while you're working from home uh, for a 24 seven kind of window, you would not realize that uh, you were not getting enough breathing space to, you know, take that break and cut off from work. Um, all of these things are leading to a lot of pressures and stresses. And these are very uh, small matters, very micro changes, which, you know, require that kind of attention and eye. And it's such a great thing that organizations are actually investing time to understand that and take steps. At this point in time, uh, I am also realizing the fact that uh, uh, there are a few changes which have happened in the last year. And a few of these changes might go back to the normal and few of them will never. So the changes uh, we're looking at are permanent. And we're also witnessing that, you know, uh, the workspaces of the future are going to be very different from what they used to be in 2019. So, um, and the fact that I have such interesting speakers with me today, um, how can I not touch upon this topic? I would want to know from all of you, and maybe I can start with Norbert first. Uh, Norbert, what is your idea or vision of the future of workplace? How do you think the, the workplaces are going to evolve in the future? So I, I think the the two trends that has uh, COVID situation has opened our eyes from our, all of us is, is, is really how much work can be literally done, most of the work in, in any place and any time. So I think where we're moving towards is, is really this notion of you need to be in the office two days, one day, three days, five days, and I still hear a lot of conversation around that. I, I, and people ask, what's the right number? I don't think there is a number. I think it's more going to what are activities that you will need to do in the office. And then, uh, so that's definitely a change of mentality to say certain activities I need to do in an environment. Or, or for example, we wanna have a team meeting that we think is more productive, a brainstorming session or whatsoever. If we, if we do it in person, then, then through technology. The second one is, just the workspaces. Obviously, employee safety has, has come up a uh, big way. It's been always there. But, but again, I think the way workspaces are going to change and the way we think about creating working environments uh, will, be, will be very different. Now, what is also very interesting for us is we talk a lot about the office, but I think the nature of relationship with customers, for example, for us, healthcare, uh, obviously going to hospitals and, and vis visiting those places, the sales organization, their interaction is changing big time uh, uh, as, as, as well. So their type of work is, uh, mm -hmm. is changing uh, as well. So that's another one. And the, the, the third one that, that I would highlight is definitely besides the technology and the nature of the relationship, what I believe is changing big time with the future work is, is, is how we incorporate well-being and how this notion of, of we need to design people's job in a way Mm -hmm. that well-being gets incorporated in there. And for example, I give you my, the, the, 
the example that I like to give to, to people is to say, if I expect people to start working at 9 a.m. or 8.30, whatever that is, basically I'm pushing them through rush hour in many places in Asia. So mm -hmm. I don't consider their personal well-being so much. But if they get to start, I don't know, at 10 or at 7 and avoid the rush hour traffic, and I'm doing this because I think for them life may be better, it mm -hmm. makes me think about shifts, working time, all those things differently. It may work or may not work in some places, but I think these will be, as you said, it's going to be a lot of small changes, and, and I think it's going to evolve. I, I think we're learning this situation. It's never going to go back to what it used to be, but, but, it's, but it's happening as we speak, and there's going to be on all these dimensions a lot of small uh, uh, changes. And it's also interesting to watch the differences between countries in the region, how it's evolved. Obviously, the current pandemic still has a big impact on who's, who is brave enough to think about what. This is, this is wonderful, Norbert. Um, I actually have two very interesting picks from what you just mentioned. Um, I, I really li liked your idea, you know, to think it in a different way, that what do you actually need the office for? So you will have to rationalize that. It's not about the number of hours and days that you're spending in the office. It's, it's more about why do you need the office if something is, uh, can be done in a much more comfortable environment. And, and the next bit is that how do you incorporate a well-being in the life of that employee? Um, and that's, that's a very, very interesting take. Um, I'd, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to know from you, Ram, uh, what is your opinion about the future of workspaces? No, um, so we did, a, for our own benefit, we, you know, we, we wanted to understand um, how our own staff would like to see that, um, you know, do they want to work from home? Do, what are they, you know, in the process of trying to decide what the future workspace should look like. And now there's a very interesting um, element that came out and that's about the fact that, you know, there's this um, a, a cultural fabric that we have when we all come into the workplace. It's not about, you know, doing my job that, that's been given as my description. I perform the job and I go back home. We're not robots, right? We're not machines. We are human beings. And a very important element of us as being as human beings is that we like to interact. We like to connect with our, with our fellow colleagues in the, in the office and build relationships, build the network. And, 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 if it, you know, and, and that's a very important you know, fabric of, of, of you know, working together uh, because team that comes together Sticks, connects together, delivers outcome together, right? So it's a very important aspect of it. Mm. The, the, and therefore, you know, the first thing that most of our staff came out and, and overwhelmingly said was, we miss that. I miss going out with my mate and, you know, grabbing a, a, a coffee or, or having lunch, just, just going and having lunch together. It's not mm. expensive lunches we talk about. We just talk about just going out and sitting together and having your food, you know, in a hawker center or wherever you, you're going to have it. Mm -hmm. They miss that big time. So, so we need to recognize the fact that when we th think about these workplace, um, uh, the initial response that many, many, many of the analysts came out and many, many predicted that the, 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 you know, the, the workplace will shrink um, physically, right? You may not need that level of um, space that you had in place. Um, and then then, then when the reality of wellness and safety and all of that started to dawn upon us, then we started to say, oh my God, we now need to think about how safe is this environment going to be and so that people can come and work together. Right now, mm -hmm. if you ask people who wear the mask in their office and they're sitting in the office, they'll tell you how much they hate about it, right? I don't mm -hmm. want to sit in an office and sitting across you know, my colleagues and have my mask and talk to them. So it's such a it's, you know, such a difficult thing to do. These, these kind of things will, will need to kind of evolve. And, 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 you know, once we see an environment that gets over, I believe that the workplace of the future will, 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 will um, and to, to Norbert's point, may not come back to what it was, uh, mm -hmm. but they will, you know, evolve a, a, a scenario where some of, some of us would definitely will be coming back to work and would prefer to come back to work, but at our own um, uh, pace and, and, and when we decide we want to come together. Obviously, when you're, in, in a, when you're in a team environment, you definitely want to be able to come back to work at some stages. So there might be some pressures on you to come back and do something together. Uh, mm -hmm. I certainly have seen, for instance, um, those kind of work that require innovation, um, you know, um, uh, working together to brainstorm ideation, 
that just does not happen in, in a virtual whiteboarding kind of things. You know, however technology might be there, you know, innovation doesn't come in isolation or in virtuality. It comes together when we get together because there's a very important human element we talk about from a behavioral science perspective. It's about in, interaction between individuals. Mm -hmm. And that interaction goes beyond your, your, your creativity or your, your knowledge. It goes into how people interact between each other. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very important aspect that will come back and people will start to come back into together to do some of those things where some of the work that can be done in, in a repetitive kind of way, you either see that automated or people will say, you know what, I have a defined uh, set of things that we need to get done, um, which we'll probably decide where and how I'll do it, right? So mm -hmm. there's this whole new aspect around understanding what is your job. Um, are you going to be continued to, so there's this whole discussion around performance management mm -hmm. in the new world, in a distributed world. What is performance? How do I manage the performance of my people? Yes. How do I know, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and again, these, these ideas or age old ideas are now getting completely revisited, right? Mm -hmm. um, think about outcomes. Most organizations, you know, we, we don't want to talk, we, you know, we, we, we tend to talk about organizations that are good at some of these games. But the majority of the organizations don't understand outcome-based models. It's, it's a new concept and, and they, they're not used to that kind of a concept. And therefore, how do you start to measure? How do I then manage the outcome that, that we want to get out of it? So those are all the things that will evolve to then make a decision around how the workplace will, will evolve over a period of time. Until then, we will continue to kind of experiment with all these different ways to see where experiment. that comes together. So, experiment and evolve, uh, you know, yes, definitely the situation is evolving. And, you know, the, the question which Norbert posed, I believe you kind of plugged in the just the right answer that, you know, what do we need workplaces for? Yes, uh, it, it's a matter of culture. It's a matter of belongingness to that space uh, to be connected with your team. And uh, you also mentioned about, you know, this is a very interesting point that you mentioned that there are certain jobs and certain things that cannot be done in isolation. You require uh, an environment to be able to deliver your best. Um, I, I would want to know at this juncture, uh, uh, that's what, what do you think uh, about workplaces of the future? Yeah, so from the corporate culture enhancement perspective, so it's a difficult to practice something together physically. So we need to explore that uh, to make new ritual as an organization. So for example, uh, having the meditation together or daily huddle or something like that. So originally in our uh, leadership team, around 100 uh, executives, so they uh, used to climb up the mountain together uh, once in a year. This is that uh, kind of physical ritual uh, leadership development activities. But uh, at this moment, uh, we, we cannot do that. So uh, start to have the daily uh, huddle, including meditation. Every, every day, the 100 executives uh, join the Zoom uh, for 15 minutes from all over the world together. And then uh, having some brief sharing and making uh, meditation or something like that. Those kinds of uh, new rituals create the new corporate culture. So uh, if we lost some touch point with the culture, we need to uh, make some additional uh, ritual uh, practices in the organization. This could be uh, helpful for better well-being and employee uh, engagement. So yeah, this is a kind of, uh, how say, communication activity, but uh, should be uh, connected with employee engagement and well-being. So this is uh, one of the uh, perspective by Max. Uh, this is such an interesting uh, uh, point that you made also, and um, it, it sounds fun as well. Uh, but um, at the same time, what it's actually doing is that organizations will have to find creative and new ways, uh, you know, to fill up that gap, that distance, uh, lack of physical interaction. And, uh, and, and this is a very, um, nice example of you know a thousand odd people coming on zoom and uh, meditating together so um just like ram mentioned in his command that you know 
evolution and experimentation will keep happening. I think more and more of these things will be experimented by organizations. Um, I would, um, you know, uh, maybe first Evelyn and then uh, Neha, I would want to know your thoughts also as to how do you envision the workplace the future are going to be like? Uh, Evelyn, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, I, I, I would not want to talk about characteristics because I think there's a lot of information out there, but rather my thoughts around um, the kind of competencies companies need to have, because um, in my mind, there isn't going to be one steady state, uh, as we have learned in the past 12 months, right, um, that they come in waves. Um, and there is no steady state. The ideal steady state is where there's ambiguity and then there is stability and there's normality. Um, I honestly don't think that there's going to be normality um, and that the new normal is, is going to come in waves depending on how the pandemic plays out. Um, and it's going to look different in different countries. Um, given the fact that change and, uh, and upheaval is going to be almost like a, a constant, um, I think that some companies will be thinking about would be some of these companies competencies that they need to build internally in order to thrive in the future. Um, and as you all have heard, this idea of, this mm -hmm. of agility, right? And agility, not just in terms of people's mindsets and behaviors, but also agility in terms of processes and systems. If I want to change the way I do things, how agile is my systems going to be in order for us to adapt the process, uh, for us to work in a different way, either in an in, in-person physical location or in a remote location? Um, the other idea is really the idea of um, the competency of able to of being able to build culture. Um, Norbeck mentioned right at the start that engagement is always at the top of, um, of leaders' mind, but right now it's taken a greater focus. Um, I actually think that there is a spectrum. Um, the, the global companies are those that think of engagement, but really there are many average smaller companies where culture engagement is not top of mind. Um, and in an environment or world where everyone works in the same location, if culture already is hard to build and hard to, hard to, uh, hard to, hard to create a sense of, of unity and teamwork, what more in an environment where the people or the workforce is going to be dispersed? Um, and, and Niha talked about earlier that it is really easy for us to dehumanize people uh, when there are just two letters on, on a Zoom call. Uh, yeah. Therefore, the question is, um, as leaders, as HR team, uh, to ask ourselves, in an environment where our workforce is going to be dispersed, and they could be dispersed not just in one country, but dispersed globally, what kind of culture do we want to have? And mm -hmm. more importantly, how do I build that kind of, of, of culture? Because just as culture building is, requires um, leaders to be very intentional to do so, in a new normal, in a new world, I think that the level of, uh, of deliberation, the level of intentionality uh, has to go to a greater and to a deeper level. And it's going to be even harder, right? Um, and on that concept, really, is this idea that in the past year, in 2020, you see huge um, efforts put in by leaders, by HR teams, to ensure the well-being of their people, to bring the people together, to put in webinars, they put in yoga classes, they do all sorts of things. Um, but is this idea of search capacity? Uh, we have put in so much in the last year because we are all responding to stress. Uh, and there is this huge adrenaline rush. Um, but the question is how sustainable are all these efforts in the longer term? Um, this is going to be for the long run, this pandemic and this whole idea of being uh, in a lockdown, in circuit breaker, it's going to be for the long run. Um, how sustainable are efforts, how sustainable are resources uh, going to be there for the long haul for HR teams or leaders to take care of the well-being of the people? So the ability to build in um, a, a process, a system such that we can continually take care of people, we can continually build culture, we can be intentional to take care of the well-being of people, it's going to be very important. Um, and the last idea which everyone talks about is this whole idea of people focus, this idea of well-being of people, the physical well-being, the emotional well-being. Again, how do we build that in when everyone is dispersed and what can we do in a way that's going to be sustainable over a long time? I don't think we all have the answers yet, uh, but I would like us to not think that there's just going to be one method or one set of ways uh, because the reality is that the new normal is going to come in multiple ways and we must have the competency that's built in in order for us to respond uh, in a very quick and agile manner in a way that is sustainable, that doesn't wear or burn out the HR team or the leadership team. This is, this is wonderful. And yes, I, I agree with you. And I'm, I'm sure most of our audience would also agree with this fact that it's a very evolving situation. And, um, uh, you know, there, there will have to be a lot of flexibility in whatever steps that an organization is taking towards culture building and employee engagement. Uh, Neha, 
what do you think about it? Yeah, I'll just take a minute to say that, you know, I think everyone on the call really summarized it well. The good thing is no one's saying this is what it will be. I think we are experimenting, we are adapting. This is this is early days. Um, I told you about the survey, we, uh, the jam we did, and um, it was interesting. Two thirds of the employees really valued the office as a hub for uh, us in IBM. Two thirds say, oh, we go there because, you know, it helps us build a network because of just the scale of the company. And the other two third, one third would be happy working from home. Um, and then we had to remind them, you know, because probably they built their network, they're up in their career, they can get work done remotely. And we had to remind them, okay, you remember the time when you needed mentors? Um, and then obviously the early professionals need that. So there is something that needs to happen and they need to give back. Um, they are thinking of office. I think for us, we are very clear. It is not just a place to get work done. I think we all know we are doing that for a year remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been doing that since the 80s and 90s. Many people were working remotely. So, so that's not uh, uh, what's new. What's new is it's very clear that office is a place where we build community, where you build culture, where you innovate, where you do experiential work together. So office is very, very important. Uh, but for these reasons, right? So Ram's point on innovation is something that really resonated with me. Um, it is very clear that serendipitous encounters are very, very critical uh, to innovation. You know, you bump into someone at the water cooler, uh, you, and, and look, all of these other calls and meetings are very orchestrated. You don't, yeah. you don't have those chance encounters, right? I knew exactly who I'm going to meet. Obviously the Q&A is separate, but you know you know what you're getting into. Whereas if you walk down the hallway, you know you're gonna meet some different people and that will lead to different ideas, different discussions. So evolving, but we've all got to adapt. And of course, you know, be agile, uh, prepare ourselves to work remotely because that's not going anywhere. Wow, that actually puts a lot of emphasis and um, a lot of expectations on leaders such as you, because organizations are going to be evolving and they would require, you know, this kind of an input and analysis and action to be put into place. So, um, yes, and this, this was such an insightful uh, discussion, um, I must admit. And, um, you know, uh, we actually have quite a few questions. So I think I would just quickly want to go to the Q&A. And uh, then maybe we can summarize uh, the points for everyone. Okay, so um, we have our first question and I'm just reading this out. Um, it would be interesting to see how the organizations strategize for engaging with employees, um, especially employee well-being and safety and keep the focus and transparency intact post COVID era at least when some normalcy percolates in the community. I would like to hear what the panel feels about this, mostly forward-looking perspective. Will the organizations continue to exponentially um, focus inwards or will there be some balance in some sort incorporated? Ram, Neha, Evelyn, any one of you would like to take this question? Sure, I can I can take it. I'm just going through its um, engaging employees and keep the focus on transparency. I uh, okay, so I'll I'll share one thing that we learned during the pandemic. I don't think it's news, new news, but I think it just accentuated the importance of trust, um, the importance of trust that organizations build with their clients, the importance of trust that employees build with their team members, with people who report to them, and literally. I think that's the biggest currency, right? So we used to, we always say skills is a very, very uh, important currency. And in the skill currency, trust actually is the highest if you have to work. So I really like the point on transparency. Uh, it is very important. I think the role of leadership and the role of organizations has evolved, right? So we are not supposed to share the news anymore because earlier you would wait for your manager to tell you what's happening, you know, the news. None of us need to do that. I think everyone has their sources. It's all becoming transparent, flat. They hear directly from social media or the CEO talks to everyone directly. I think the role of leadership and enterprises will be to um, uh, give the context behind the news, right? Um, and will we continue for exponentially continue to focus inwards? Um, I think 
more and more the organizations are collaborating and learning from each other. Um, yeah. I think what I really value during the pandemic was coming together with my colleagues. Um, uh, I spoke to the HR leader of Microsoft. I spoke to the HR leader of um, many of our competitors and really said, okay, what are you guys doing? This is what we are doing. It was cooperation and learning from each other because one person did not have the playbook. So I think, um, you know, more than anything, we are not learning, we're not inward. We are actually, this expands and you really need to cooperate and work together um, in a situation like this. That's the only way you can do the right thing for the employees. Over to anyone else who'd like to answer. Um, okay, so I think I'll take the next question in that case. Um, so we have another question, which is, now related to sports. So with work from home scenario, it's a continuous and ongoing work to keep motivating the teams. Like we all discussed that, you know, you, this is a continuous effort. What, according to you all, is one factor which has been most critical to keep everyone going? So it could be communication for some. Um, a, a let, 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 let me maybe try to take a look at and actually my answer would be I don't think there is one thing I, I think it's for these issues there's hardly the silver bullet we we we, we like to to you know read the three easy steps and the five easy things to do but but I think it's it's a combination of of, of, of a lot of small things uh, that 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 we can do and I think it's realizing that there's different groups of people having different challenges and you need to do different things because as, as we've been discussing some people are craving to get back to the office and using every opportunity because they don't have the space, the, the environment to work properly from home, whereas others prefer to do so. So my point is, I don't think there is one thing. I don't think it makes sense to do, look for one thing. I think it's, you know, like a, like, a, like a good soup. It needs a lot of small ingredients. And if you put them together in the right way, then you have a, a great result. And it may be slightly different. I mean, we talk about, you know, IBM and Rakuten here two companies very engaged in, in technology and IT. Obviously, we are a very different company in the, in the, in the medical device world with, with actual you know, manufacturing sites and, and so on. So, so I, I think the ingredients are different, but one thing is sure that you have to understand what people need and you have to not do one big thing, but I would say lots of small things continuously Absolutely. will probably get you there. Micro arrangements, micro engagements will be required in the future. Neha, we have one more question for you. Um, you talked about authentic leadership, which is very interesting point. My question is that being a leader at times, there is very thin line when it comes to what to share, how to share. How does your leadership ensure that the share is taken in a positive way and not misconstrued? Yeah, great question. I, I think uh, during this uh, year, the pandemic, um, uh, last year, actually, it seemed like this year, um, but during last year, you know, a lot of companies had to make a lot of hard decisions. Um, there was companies who shut down, you know, there were videos of startups being uh, closed. And then you wonder, okay, you know, should, I, should you tell the employees to keep going or should you be authentic? How transparent can you be? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important um, to share the context and to be transparent to the extent that you can. And if you can't, to share that at this point, you will not be able to, at least that's been our strategy in ASEAN. Uh, whenever decisions have been made, we've given context behind why, um, you know, and, and really that's what courage in leadership is all about, right? We all, we all study about that, get trained about that, uh, but being vulnerable at times, um, that's also authentic leadership telling them you don't know. I think that's the best thing that we did um, during the pandemic to say, we will come back. We don't have the answer. We don't have the playbook. And we literally published a playbook after that, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't, I think that's authentic leadership, sharing what you don't know, crowdsourcing. Um, how, do your, how does your leadership ensure what they share is taken in a positive way and not misconstrued? Look, I mean, the important thing here is First of all, the commitment to the purpose. Uh, people need to understand what the purpose of the organization is. People need to understand the uh, purpose of what you're trying to do. And if, if it is aligned with your values and purpose, um, I think the, uh, the question of trust does not come in. However, there are some people who will not be happy and there are some people who will be okay with the decision. I think that's important to know, right? In, in many hard decisions that you take, you have to figure out who's not happy and then figure, uh, 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 mitigate the risks. Uh, but being authentic and being honest, um, 
is is a sign of courageous leadership and that's something um i think any organization should follow especially when you have to align it with the, with your values back to you vagmita that's very well answered neha sorry vagmita if i can add um, to what neha said she's she yes. said absolutely the right set of things perhaps if i give a slightly a different point that i've seen and observed is mm -hmm. that not everyone is a good orator and leaders have struggled in virtual settings to communicate because when you're in a physical setting and you're talking to your people you know the reactions um uh, people's body language tell you that you don't get the body language in a virtual setting so i think it's important to recognize the fact that if you don't want to be misconstrued uh, and if you recognize the fact that you not by you know, a natural um speaker get some training get you know learn how you know how to communicate what are the do's and don'ts i think it's important to recognize this because i've seen um in 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 some instances where leaders have struggled because in in they tried their every possible way in a transparent way uh um, and 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 uh, try to share and just come back and hit them in a pretty big way and 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 you do definitely want to be careful about that so it does take a little bit of effort so it might be worth putting investing some time on this this is yeah and this actually directly indicates to the evolution of a leader in the years so yes uh, leaders i'm sure would have uh, um gone through this transition and then you would have uh, of them would have been open to take uh, advice from people so very happy said ram ram we actually have one more question for you let me read it out for you um really liked your point on criticality of human interaction how much ever technology evolves but till the time that happens what do you think helps employees interact amongst themselves apart from work calls and bring stronger relationships and a robust work culture i'm also reading it by the way so <laughs> thanks okay. for reading it aloud um look um what what i have uh, in 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 what i would encourage is let the employees talk to themselves in you know create an environment for a day can connect and talk like how we've done in the workplace we have not actually said we will be in meetings all the day right the mm -hmm. staff get together they sit together in one corner and talk or they you know come around the the pantry area or wherever there's a place where they can connect and they connect and talk they miss that i think we should we should encourage them now now that you know especially from again if i give you a singapore context um get them to go out and and catch up with each other right um that connect should continue to happen so i'm you know we're seeing that we are actively promoting it as well we're asking our 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 staff to go on and connect with each other um and i've seen them going in groups and and catching up over lunch or whatever they they prefer to do i think that's very important we we need to encourage that to happen leaders need to encourage it's not always leaders to staff it's it's peer to peer as well we got to recognize that peer to peer networking is very critical um to keep the values going so i think we need to to encourage that to happen um and 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 uh, it and 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 look for you know um signs of where things might go wrong and how quickly you, you know you can find a way to respond to that you actually get from these kind of conversations so encourage that to happen um do encourage um uh, and i say this uh, do encourage people to if they feel um comfortable to come together um and 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 meet in person and i'm seeing more and more uh, uh as 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 you know we see the environment getting a bit more safer um uh, we you know i'm seeing more and more people are willing to come out there and meet in person because i think every one of us um are are feeling a little bit left out if you're sitting at home all the time so i think take that opportunity connect better um and 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 you know continue to evolve that uh as the situation gets better maybe you'll do that more in the workplace not necessarily you know outside so encourage our, you know outside of the workplace kind of a connect as well that will be very helpful to, to keep that morale going to keep that connectivity going very interesting uh, ram and actually something very related to what you just spoke uh i we have a very interesting question we may not be able to take all of them but this is one interesting one that uh, you know i would want your views on this has come from the lead of corporate communications for strides pharma from india and um, uh, while it it's a long question and you all can read it uh, uh, what what probably uh, uh, usha is kind of trying to portray is that you know how this whole function 
of um, uh, HR and communication has become so, so critical for the CEOs. And, uh, you know, it's almost like becoming the right hand uh, in a way. And uh, uh, she's asking, do you think the pride of place, our functions acquired in these months is also here to stay? Can we now be deeper business partners to the CEO in that sense? Uh, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, and, and I think you see, not just at the CEO level, you're probably now going to, um, you know, be uh, more in front of the, the next layers of leadership as well. Because um, remember, communication is not always just at, from the top. Um, you know, we need communication at all levels, right? So the tier two, the tier three leadership as well. And, and depending on the size of the organization you are, um, you know, you might be running like in, you take you take IBM, you take Rocket and, you know, very, very large organizations with multi-layered leaderships. Uh, it's not one CEO that's always going to be out there communicating. Communication will happen across multiple layers. I think um, the role of corporate communications in shaping some of those conversations uh, or communications is going to be extremely critical. At the same breath, I might also make another point that don't make it too plastic. Don't make it too robotic, right? Because that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the um, uh, trap that you, you, know, you might put the leaders into because this has to be a little bit authentic, right? So you know, some of this cannot be too rehearsed. If it's too rehearsed, people will see through especially in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a virtual setting, because they say, oh, seems like you're reading from a, from a script. That could be a big um, uh, downside if you try to you know, tailor it too much. So um, drive the, the, the key messages and how that messages get communi gets communicated, uh, but allow the leaders to kind of put it into their language. Mm. Because every one of us speak in a slightly different way, use mm. different set of words, and let that come out. And if you know, and, and people see this through very, very quickly, and they say, Oh my god, you're reading from a script. I, you're, you know, Neha talked about trust, the trust starts to break there. It's like, Oh my god, you're just reading from this stuff. I'm not, I don't want to be part of this. So, watch out for that. But I totally agree that uh, corporate communications will, will continue, you know, will evolve to be a central to, to a lot of the communication that happens in organizations going forward. I think with this question, I, I would also want to hear um, Norbert, Neha, or Tatsuo, would you want to also uh, respond to this question? Uh, can I add uh, Lam's comment? Yes, yes. So, especially the leadership communication uh, to employees uh, will be, uh, I'll say, changed. So, as Neha mentioned, the most important thing is the context sharing uh, behind the result or behind the fact or something like that because we, we cannot share the context physically so uh, in order to share some internal uh, PR uh, information or uh, some other uh, great achievement in this situation of course we can share the result or recognition uh, from the top leadership but uh, we want to care about that context sharing story sharing so this is the powerful to engage under the one umbrella and the same purpose. So this could be uh, one of the crucial uh, points to design the message from leadership. So this is the uh, comment from my, myself. That, that's a very valid point. I believe even Norbert wanted to speak something. Norbert, would you want to add something to this? Uh, I, I was just thinking about this, you know, how long it will last and, and, and the business partnering with the, with the CEO. I, I, I think it's, um, I think the relationship, I guess, has, has evolved. And, and it, for me, as, as we discussed, some of the, some of the aspects have, have became evidently more important from, from, you know, it became the burning issues. And, and it's always in business always likes to for, focus on what's the burning issues and the long steady growth, which many things in HR and culture are, is always more difficult. So, so I think uh, it is depends on, on, on us. I'm sure, you know, there's going to be times and during, I don't know, financial crisis, obviously treasury will get a special focus. So it's going to be in ups and downs, but, but, but the fact that this is something important and, and you have that role, whatever you may be focused on, I, I, I think it's, it's sure there because I think what overall HR in general 
uh, has quite well stepped up. And I think everybody agrees with that, the business and, and the functions as well across the world. I mean, it's a big generalization, uh, but, but I, I, I think generally over the last year, HR across the world has, has, has stepped up in, um, in helping businesses to, to deal with this situation. And I think everybody has recognized that employees, leaders, and, and so on, which I think generally the function can be quite happy or proud of. Yes, and, and like we discussed, you know, the fact that the, the workspaces are very evolving. The situation is still evolving and really don't know how to shape up. Uh, this function is going to uh, stay relevant, important, and there will be a, a huge ownership on uh, people in the communication and the uh, employee side of things. So yes, thank you so much. And uh, um, I believe we've already cut on our time. There are a few more questions that we have received. Um, um, but maybe what we can do is we can pass on these questions to the speakers uh, and uh, get you the responses. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this session. It was very insightful indeed. And uh, we are actually, including our audience, I'm sure we are taking a lot of takeaways, um, feeling better prepared for the future. And um, uh, we will meet soon uh, with our next series um, in a couple of months, and we'll be discussing more about how employee engagement strategies and um, uh, the employee uh, landscape is changing and evolving in Southeast Asia. Thank you so much, everyone, once again, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.